I uh, note uh, Rajan's um, earlier communication about short notice and um, when I was, uh, I think it was yesterday, maybe the day before, I was, uh, I was invited kindly to come and talk about climate change in Mount Everest and um, I'm a, uh, an ecologist by profession so I can tell you a lot about the bushland and most of the animals that actually live here. Um, but the ecology of Mount Everest probably isn't a strong point for me, but uh, climate change associated with Mount Everest I thought I could, um, I could probably have a reasonable, um, reasonable go at. Um, so I guess the fundamental principle for me is um, we hear a lot about climate change in the media. Um, originally we heard a lot about um, the ozone layer and the, and the hole in the ozone layer and what that was contributing in terms of the heating of the planet. Um, so I thought I'd start with just a couple of the, uh, I guess, that, those fundamental principles associated with climate change and then move towards how that actually affects both our, uh, our environment at the moment and, uh, and those impacts associated with Mount Everest as well. So, um, uh, so certainly thanks very much for the opportunity to come and uh, kind of speak to you about it. Um, if we start with the basics, the, um, the ozone layer is like a, um, um, it gets very confused with, with climate change, but it's basically the big blanket that goes around the Earth that is like the sunscreen of the Earth. So, um, so there's a lot of media going back sort of 20 years ago about holes in the ozone layer and what was going on. And the big risk there is the, um, as the hole got bigger, more UV light comes in, so the sunscreen depreciates and that heats the actual earth, provides additional UV light to the actual earth, actually making it, making it a bit tighter. Um, the good news about the ozone layer is there was strong action and very, very good human intervention in regard to something called carbon. Um, Carbon fluoro, fluoro, flu, fluorocarbons, which were, or CFCs for their, their term, which were depreciated in the ozone layer. So there was very tidy action in, in intervention in reducing the fluoro, fluorocarbons across the actual planet. Which now, since the 1990s, the actual hole has stabilised. So probably some of the better news around our, um, I guess, our heating of the planet is that hole stabilised. Um, so the temperature of the planet, or the UV radiation reaching the planet has actually been consistent since the 1990s. So, um, so that's helpful in that regard, but unfortunately that's probably the best news on climate on, uh, in terms of the heating of our planet that we've got to, to date. Um, so when we move on from there, we talk about then what's called our gre the greenhouse effect. Um, the greenhouse effect on Earth is um, a further blanket that wraps around the planet. So it's actually natural, because um, things like carbon dioxide and methane are actually natural products within the Earth. But um, it naturally maintains the planet at about 15 degrees Celsius on, uh, on an average, um, I guess, an average, average temperature. Um, that's a temperature that supports life and, uh, and, and is quite functional. Um, without that natural, I guess, um, greenhouse layer around the planet, we wouldn't be country, we'd be frozen. So um, I guess a lot of planet scientists call up, call it the Goldilocks planet because it's not too hot, not too cold, and that greenhouse effect around us maintains that temperature for temperature for life. So it's quite important. Where the um, where the trouble starts is it's the human sort of intervention, or man man made intervention, and increasing of actual our um, I guess our greenhouse gases into the uh, into the atmosphere. Um, what happens there is the in the, since early industrialisation, I guess since the early sort of 1750s round around there, um, when we started to really ramp up the actual burning of fossil fuel and industrialisation, that's when we start to really emit those key uh, key greenhouse gases. Um, so what's happened there is that that man-induced increase is actually increases the gases, which causes further warming of the planet. So the UV radiation is coming in, it's reflecting back to the actual greenhouse gases, which sort of bundle it up and reflect it back and forth to the planet, which maintains that temperature. That temperature's going up because we've got more gas in the actual atmosphere to, uh, to actually do that, to, uh, to insulate, the, uh, insulate the planet. Um, I guess, and that, uh, that gas is, as we are, as sort of widespread fossil fuels are a big contributor to it. So there's, um, there's probably four key gases that are, that are, um, that are really c contributing to that, uh, to that increased warming. So uh, carbon dioxide, which everyone's reasonably familiar with, you know, um, plants produce it as well. Um, but obviously the burning of fossil fuels is a huge contributor to the actual carbon dioxide production. Um, another nasty is the, uh, the methane production. So that comes through the transportation and I guess refinement of uh, petrochemicals as well. Um, a lot of natural, natural gas is uh, comprised wholly of, mainly of methane as well. So when that's harvested from the actual earth leakage, is natural gas and methane into the atmosphere, which is, a, which is an additional gas. Um, nitrous oxides, which come through the, the agricultural industries um, and the use of fertilisers, and once again, burning of fossil fuels as well, um, are quite, uh, quite significant. And there's uh, fluorinated gases as well. Now, these are man-made gases and sort of started to be made around the 1920s. Um, so the production of those uh, fluorinated gases also contribute to our gases. So they're, they're the four key I guess, elements that are really contributing to our, to our greenhouse effect. Um, 
the, um, the interesting fact is from the uh, from the Knights, I guess the 1750s when industrialisation started, um, there was quite a significant there there wasn't a significant increase from what we know from ice cores in the actual greenhouse gases. It's been steadily developing over time. Um, so I guess since 1750, uh, our CO2 levels have increased by 40 percent, methane's increased by 150 percent, um, and in nitrous oxides are about 20 percent. But the last 40 years of that have really escalated the actual contributions in it. So we've been um, I guess contributing to it since the 1750s, but really that last 40 years we have really ramped things up to, uh, to increase those, um, those gases. Um, there's probably four key activities that occur that, uh, that lead to the primary production, or, or I guess are the big offenders, if you like, in regard to production of gases. Uh, the first is the production of electricity and heat. Um, and yeah, electricity and heat are extremely important for the functioning of life, but it's the, once again, the electricity production and heat production, like the burning of fossil fuels is what's contributing. That, that CO2 products and those methane products. Um, that's about 25% of all global greenhouse gases that contribute from our energy, electricity and heat production. Uh, the next big one comes from our agricultural land use. Uh, when I talk about land use, we're really looking at um, including the deforestation, so the removal of vegetation, whether in the Congo, whether in the Amazon, even through Australia, we're pretty good at vegetation clearing as well. That land use depreciates, obviously, the ability to actually extract CO2 from the atmosphere. Um, as well as the agricultural practices that fertiliser you're using. And your livestock production is a huge contributor of methane to it as well. So that's, uh, that's once again, about another 25% of their global contributions come to, uh, in terms of greenhouse gases. Um, the other big ones are really your industrial manufacturing, like your production of steel and your production of cement type industry. So that really heavy industry production is a major computer, uh, con contributor. And, uh, and then the one we're all fairly familiar with is your transportation. So all the uh, all the burning of your fuels in regard to your, uh, yeah, whether it's your motor vehicles, it's your trucks, it's your shipping, it's your transportation, um, air flight, air, um, aircraft as well, all contribute to that combustion of fossil fuels. So that's, yeah, that's your big one. So they're four key activities, I guess, that we undertake as humans and what we say human-made greenhouse uh, effects that are, uh, are actually putting us in the current position we are in regard to uh, our greenhouse situation. Um, so today our greenhouse gases are higher than they've ever been um, in terms of the monitoring, the monitoring that's occurred across the planet. Um, we've had an increase in our temperature of one degree Celsius. Um, that's, you look at the average temperature across the, across the Earth. So we've had a one degree increase. Uh, we hear a lot about the threshold being 1.5 degrees, so that's where we're on track to reach. And, uh, and we're looking at reaching that by 2030, maybe up to 2050 if, we're, uh, if, we, uh, if we get some fairly timely intervention. Um, we consistently record the hottest years on record, year after year. Um, there might be a couple of years where we fluctuate, we're not quite as hot, but uh, consistently the trend is that we're getting hotter years one after another. Um, the, um, and ob there's obviously, uh, I guess, resp climatic responses to that. You know, we see floods, we see, uh, we see cyclonic type, type events. Um, we see severe droughts. Um, what we actually do is we make our, our wetter areas stay a lot wetter, uh, so they get more precipitation, and our drier areas stay a lot drier for a lot longer as well. So that's all sort of effective in that grass and that, in, in that balance of that actually increased warming. Um, obviously, we get our, um, our sea level rises through our thermal expansion. We heat things up, water expands, obviously, and I uh, don't uh, mention that the polar glacier is actually melting, and the melting of glaciers also contributes that additional uh, additional water to our, uh, to our sea levels. Um, ecosystem change we hear a lot about. Um, you know, the classic one is the reef and the change to the uh, actual reef itself through the coral bleaching and, uh, and what impact that actually has on both habitation for animals. Um, I guess from an ecology perspective, animals change their ranges, particularly a migratory species. So, say we have birds that migrate from Siberia to Australia. As things warm up and uh, I guess the productivity of different areas change as well, that, change the, that changes those migration habits of the actual birds across the planet as well, as well as local impacts of the same in Australia. Where the range may change with various reptiles and amphibians, so they have to move further north or further south to continue to survive as, uh, as things actually change. Um, and uh, I guess one of those, um, the other impacts that you really look at too, that's probably a little bit unrecognised, is um, as things warm up, we also get that insect activity that increases as well. I mean, the insect activity potential with disease carrying insects, uh, like. Uh, the, um, from um, say um, mosquitoes is uh, is also a significant human health effect that we get associated with. Um, okay, let's get to Mount Everest. Uh, I think that's what we're here. Um, now, I guess some of the some of the work I looked at. There's a um, the glacier that's the highest glacier in the world, which is uh, the Southern Coal. I think it is at the top of Everest. Now that's um, it was interesting to see that what's happened there over the 
decades, the, uh, the heating of the planet has caused the snow to melt off, melt off the actual uh, the ice that's actually uh, that, that forms the glacier. So the snow is very, very good at reflecting UV radiation off it. So it's actually, for decades, it's protected the ice underneath the coal. Now, what's actually happened over the last few decades is the snow has melted, which has then had UV radiation directly affecting the, um, the ice of the glacier itself. Um, so the glacier is actually reduced in size by about half, and it's thinned by about 55 metres overall. So imagine the length of an Olympic swimming pool in the glacier is thinning by that much. That's a significant reduction in that highest glacier on Earth. So that's a point where you think we'd be safe in regard to global warming, but, uh, but it's having a significant impact up there at the, at the moment. Um, <laughs> And I guess some of the um, associated with the, that melting, and I guess, you know, if that's the highest glacier you've been affected, there's a whole lot of other glaciers, both in the layers and further down Everest, that have been affected as well. So that, uh, that creates some, uh, some serious challenges. And we look at the, uh, I guess, the recreation, like, you know, the, the mountaineering associated with Everest. Um, future expeditions, what the heating does is it, uh, it makes a lot of the, the snow areas there still more susceptible to avalanche as well. So we increase the actual risk to visitors to that mountain by the increased number of avalanches that are caused by that actual temperature uh, temperature increase. Um, we also get, uh, because we're, we're losing snow and ice, obviously um, people who are uh, traversing the area are covering a lot more, I guess, uncovered rock and bedrock than the, what they would be, what traditionally be covered in, uh, in snow and ice to actually traverse, traverse as well. Um, there was one little fact I came across which I found um, found quite, uh, quite interesting. I'm, I don't think the certainty is actually been proven yet, but as, um, as your air temperature increases, it causes your, um, your oxygen molecules to collide. They, they move a lot faster, so they collide, so as, um, which subsequently increases air pressure. And as you increase air pressure, you have more molecules in the actual area, so you have more oxygen at higher elevations. So in theory, you may be able to go higher up Mount Everest without support of oxygen in the future. Um, to what extent, I don't know. I don't think it's a particularly significant amount, so you're not going to be able to walk to the top without oxygen. Um, fairly regularly, but uh, but yeah, I guess that's uh, that's one one interesting issue associated with that uh, with that increasing temperatures. Um, so we know the glaciers are thinning at nearly um, nearly twice the rate as what they were previously. We've got the rising temperatures associated with it uh, and the additional snow and ice melts, and um, and I guess part of that melting of the snow is the um, the actual localized flood. So as we get significant increases in that melting, we get more water. What used to be a steady, I guess, stream of water coming from it during those melt seasons and the communities around it depended on that melt and that fresh water. We actually get sort of flash floods from these significant increases in the, in the water that's available to those, uh, to those areas. Um, and I guess that leads me a little bit to the, uh, to the pollution side of Everest because this melting in the actual water catchment, what we get um, over years and years and years, I guess there's been a lot of material that's been buried across Everest, there's, and particularly around around waste. Um, so there's a, um, I know some recent studies that were done up there. They took snow from as close to the top of Everest as they, they could collect those samples, and they actually found what we call microplastics in the snow right at the top, and uh, and that correlates with a recent study that was at the bottom of the Earth as well. So in the Mariana Trench, they did uh, they did some surveys there, and they found microplastics there. So we've got microplastics sitting right at the bottom of the Earth and right at the actual top of the Earth. And uh, I think a lot of the sources of the microplastics, where it, ropes, clothing, and the material that it gets used in, in mountaineering, has been left behind. And when we say microplastics, that's less than five millimetres in size, so it's the stuff that uh, that can, can be ingested and will sort of you know, flow quite easily within when, as we uh, we get meltwaters coming off the mountain. Um, there's about up to 600 to 800 people try and climb the mountain each year. Each of those people take. About and in support, there's about it's about a one to one ratio for the climbers to the actual support people. So each of those people are carting in about eight kilograms of rubbish every, uh, every, uh, per person. So for that rubbish to go there and be left behind, you can imagine over the years is a significant accumulation of material on the actual mountain. Um, and then and the forms that we get there as well as um, material left behind, it's the it's the O2, it's the you know, the oxygen bottles that are actually left behind. Uh, people leave their tents behind, they leave all sorts of other other materials. The, um, the only place we've got toilets going in there is at base camp. So once you leave base camp and start to set up the mountain, um, obviously where we get, uh, I guess, the, the, the human waste that's actually been left behind becomes a, a serious issue associated with that. Um, and I guess you, when we talk about the watershed coming off the mountain, as all these wastes are left behind, we get the watershed coming off. So we get these serious contamination issues associated with water, which the communities are actually dependent on to actually uh, re receive that water and depend on it. Um, things like fecal contamination, 
cause issues like uh, like cholera and hepatitis A. So we've got serious health issues associated with the pollution events that we're getting there, which has been exacerbated by the melt by the melting of the snow and the actual glacial areas. Um, pleased to see there's been a few initiatives um, implemented by the uh, Nipalali government, which is great. Um, they, uh, in 2019, they commissioned a campaign to take 10,000 kilograms of waste off the mountain, um, which is great. I guess the, the issue is you go in there, you remove the waste, you get a further melt, uh, you get a further melt, and there's a whole lot more waste there to actually remove as well. So it seems like a, a never-ending exercise for the government to actually try and remove that waste from the, from the mountain, despite the best efforts. Um, I note in 2014, um, with people climbing the mountain, um, everyone leaves a deposit about four thousand um, dollars and that deposit is for your eight kilograms of rubbish so if you uh, if you bring eight kilograms of rubbish back you get your deposit back if you don't um, i think it's obviously seriously reduced in regard to the amount of material you're actually putting back so that's sort of, i guess that proactive approach to try and reduce the amount of material that's actually left on the island which is, which is great to see um i guess just to uh Finalise. There's um, there's probably five key things that we can do in our day to day life here that can probably that can try and I guess slow down or at least do our part in uh, I guess that fight against climate change. Um, the first one is in, um, in Australia we have the members of government. We have we have federal we have a federal election. We have state government. We have local government. So there's always an election on the go, and um, our politicians are quite nervous creatures by nature. Um, so letting them know that you're concerned about climate change and that you would like to uh, yeah and would like to see action on that is really important. It doesn't matter what colour they are. It's just about important that they recognise that people are worried about climate change and they want to do it. And it's the decisions these government makes in regard to our the removing of the natural resources that we have, whether it's coal mining, whether we're removing natural gas, all levels of government make these decisions. Our local governments make decisions about our infrastructure in regard to our cycle tracks, our walking ability, our parks, um, yeah, we've got beautiful parks like Vancouver and Brisbane, and the preservation of those, which is important in terms of managing the local vegetation. Uh, so I guess that advocation to political representatives is really, really important. Um, just letting you know that you are interested in climate change and want to see, want to see action on it. Um, the second thing I've got is um, just be mindful of what we actually eat. And um, you know, obviously, it's, uh, it's very, very easy to eat things that are out of season that have a high co fuel cost and transportation cost associated with moving things around. Um, as I mentioned earlier, meat products um, are very, very, you know, particularly red meats are very, very heavy in terms of uh, in, in terms of uh, methane production. Um, so just be mindful. We don't have to give up meat nor become vegetarians or vegans, but we do. Um, but just that mindfulness about what we actually consume and the impact that that may have on uh, on our actual climate, on our emissions. Um, try to use your car less. I guess would be my third point. Um, yeah, it's uh, yeah. If we can walk, if we can ride, if we can use public transport, um, if we can carpool, all those things you know reduce that use and particularly that CO2 type of emissions that we have. Um, you know, if you're thinking about getting a new car, you know, think about getting an electric car. Joe's a big fan of electric cars. We'll get a we'll get a hybrid. Yeah, something that uses less fuel is really really good. Um, you know, don't just ditch your car and go and go and get a brand new electric one. It's got some life in it. Keep using it because that embedded energy in the vehicle takes a, takes a lot of emissions just to produce it. But uh, if you are getting a new one, yes, yeah, things are used to get getting something that, 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 that uses a whole lot less, less fuel. Um, I guess the fourth thing would be just uh, be mindful of your energy use at home. If you've got, um, you know, if you've got uh, appliances that you're not actually using, unplug them, don't use them, use your efficiency bulbs, turn stuff off when it's not actually being used. Look at the um, your heating and cooling of your house as well. Um, if your house is insulated, obviously you don't have to heat it and cool it as much. Um, do you really need the heater on if you've got the jumper inside? Um, oh, that might be my, uh, my time to uh, go. <laughs> uh, that's a hurry up. Um, so just, 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 yeah, sustainable options like that are really, really helpful to reduce your overall weight. And uh, I guess the fifth thing I'd ask you to do is, um, with the, the things that you do yourself, start a conversation with your friends, with your family and everything else, because it's really well understood that if, uh, if people you talk to and friends, if they think you're doing something in something in the environment, there's a very, very good chance that they'll start doing the same thing as well, just out of that respect and I guess that, that sort of embracing it uh, from a community perspective. So, um, so yeah, so if you can do, uh, do all, all those five things, or do one of them, um, it's certainly going to help. It's going to help Mount Everest, that's for sure. What we do here is directly affecting what's happening there. Um, so, yeah, I think it would be a very good outcome for our planet. So, thanks for your time, everyone. Really appreciate it.